if you're doing it on your own, you're going to run out of money, out of your own money. We only have a limited number of capital that we're able to to utilize to fund our own um, to fund our own projects. However, if you're able to partner with other people, it's incredible because now the opportunities are limitless. You're able to do bigger things that you might not have otherwise um, thought or dreamed of. If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. Well, welcome to the show. I have got an amazing guest to join me today that's going to share with you step by step how she has raised millions of dollars in private money from private investors. So, welcome to the show. But my guest today, she's a real estate investor, and her focus these days is really on investing in multifamily uh, projects by using syndication. Well, what is syndication? Syndication, I'm actually going to let her give the definition of that. But anyway, she is in all markets all across the United States. Now, in the past, she also has experience in managing financial budgets for multi-billion dollar projects actually in the aerospace industry. Well, she is a working professional. She's a parent of two young children. And you know what? She wants to spend time with her children. She wants to see her children grow up, be a part of, her, of their growing up years. So what does she want? And what has she created? Time and freedom for her family. Well, yes, she wants to be there for the milestones of her children. And, you know, having a full-time job can actually create a challenge as to how you make all that work together. Well, she has proven and now knows that investing in real estate syndications, yes, she's going to find that, is the best vehicle to achieve her goals. And she's going to share that with you. In other words, how is it that she has actually figured out how to have income passively and let the money do the work. Well, my guest and good friend, she's all excited about sharing her knowledge and talking about the advantages of investing in real estate syndication that does actually create that time and freedom. And with that, I'm so excited to welcome to my show, Eileen Pratt. Hello, Eileen. Welcome to the show. Hi, Jay. Thank you for having me. And what an introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you can tell I'm pretty excited and passionate about having you come on, right? Yes. No, I love it. <laughs> well, that's great. Thanks for taking time out to come on the show, Eileen. So we're going to, we're going to spend a good bit of time about talking about private investors, private money, private lending, the benefits of it for the borrower, for the investor and all that. So let's start out with this, as I just said. Share, what exactly do you mean when you say syndication? Well, syndication is really just a fancy word that just means a group investment. And so simply, it, that's all it is. It's a group investment where uh, people come together, pool their resources together, uh, whether it be their knowledge, experience, uh, background, capital, coming together and um, being able to purchase something that they wouldn't be able to on their own as a group instead. And so top level, high level syndications, group investments. Group investments. And so... Um, how is this, uh, how is being part of a syndication as a private investor? Let's stop right there. Who is a private investor? Are, are we talking about institutions, banks? Are we, uh, what are, what's a private investor? Well, for us, who we work with primarily are individuals. So, you know, like myself, people who have family members, our family themselves, um, just individuals who are, you know, they're working their W-2 jobs on a day-to-day -day basis, um, just average normal people, uh, you know, not necessarily has to be institutions, but just individuals themselves. Well, there's 
a lot of benefits to the syndicator, if you will. So in this case, of course, I believe you've done both sides of the table. You have invested in syndications and you've also raised a lot of money from private investors for your own syndication, correct? Yes. Yeah. So you understand both sides of the table and the benefits are like pretty long. So let's start with the private investor or the private you know, individual, the human being that wants to invest in a syndication. So let me turn it over to you, um, Eileen. What are the benefits? Why would an individual want to be involved in a syndication? Why do they want to invest in it? And, and you know, what are the benefits to them? And why would they be interested? Well, have you ever invested in something? Like, let's say if you were to invest in something where you didn't have to put in any efforts on the day-to-day -day management, you don't have to deal with the tenants, you leave it to the sponsors and the people who are actually putting the syndications together to actually handle all that. So really, as an investor in these syndications, if you invest capital into this type of investment vehicle, it's really just mailbox money where your money is just now working for you. You don't have to think about anything at all. And so for a working professional or people who have family who have no interest in dealing with the day-to-day -day tenants, um, being a landlord, but still want the benefits of investing in real estate, still getting those benefits of um, depreciation, tax benefits that come with investing in real estate, but do not want to handle and be a landlord themselves. This is a perfect vehicle for them to be able to just invest their money and really just get mailbox money that's coming into their door. What different types of projects do you have your real estate investors or lenders that are actually investing in this fund? Uh, what kind of projects uh, do you syndicate that they um, will or would invest in? So we focus on multifamily investing. Um, and so what we look at are properties in like B or B or C type class properties in like a B type areas. So there's a lot of opportunities there to raise the um, rents, to improve the property, bring it up to market value rent so that you're really improving the bottom line. So your net operating income. And so that's where it's a little bit different when you're investing in a multifamily opportunity or multifamily apartment um, where it's five units or more, the valuation of that property is calculated based off of the operating income, not necessarily the comparables. So when we're operating it, we're looking for opportunities where we can improve the net operating income at the bottom line and therefore increasing the overall value of the property itself. And so those are the types of properties that we look at where there's a lot of um, opportunities to bring up the value. So underperforming properties, um, properties that are not, uh, you know, renting it out at the full potential of the market where the market demands it. You know, you can renovate those properties, bring it up to a higher level, um, rent it out for a little bit more. And what the what the neighboring uh, areas, those tenants, those resident, residents are actually wanting to and willing to um, pay for those uh, types of properties to live in. You mentioned the asset class that you like to invest in or what you referred to as B properties, B as in boy. So you got A properties, B properties, C properties, D properties. How about give a definition to what is a B property? versus an A property or a C or a D property? So your A properties are the ones that are, you know, around like 10 years that they've been built. So they're very pretty new. You're, you're going to have very low maintenance on these types of properties. You're going to get those higher tiered uh, tenants where they're, you know, primarily um, higher incomes, uh, higher income. And the property itself is very low maintenance because it's a newer property and it's in a, in a really good area as well. Um, so you're getting things like, uh, you know, those, um, uh, uh, clubhouses, you're getting um, some additional amenities, a gym, you know, you can look at the fixtures, it's a higher end type of quality. 
Uh, for the B classes, it's a little bit older properties, so usually between um, around 20 years old or something like that. We still have some maintenance issues that are going on with it. Um, there's some room for improvement there. However, it's still a good operating property. Um, you're typically renting to like uh, the white collar employee or white collar residents, and so uh, with families, and so those are the types of tenants that are typically renting in the B properties. Um, you're still getting some good amenities, but it's not gonna be as you know high end as the A or newer properties. Um, and then the C class properties, you're typically renting to like the blue collar uh, working individuals. And so those are, you're going to be dealing with you know older properties as well. So there's typically a little bit more maintenance that's involved with it uh, because it's an older property. So they're usually over 30 years old or so. And so uh, those are type, types of different. So it's primarily going to be based off of the year and then what kind of maintenance um, is involved with the older types of properties and then also the tenant base that uh, that are, re are renting out those types of properties. I know it depends on the project, but what's a range rate of return that your real estate investors in syndication can expect to receive? So within syndications, what we like to say, especially when you compare it to the stock market, it's, you know, you're investing in above average returns. And so you're not getting those volatile, volatile like numbers where you're able to see the spikes up and the and the lows down um, within the stock market. So it's really stable, a stable asset class that you're going to, uh, you know, achieve cash flow, consistent cash flow. And at the same time, uh, at the sale of it, you also get to achieve some of the upside based off of the improvements to the net operating income. So the value and appreciation that comes along with it is also passed down to the investors as well. So it's just not a rate of return like an interest rate, uh, like someone would get in comparison to such as a certificate of deposit in the bank, which of course today is about a quarter of a percent per year. Um, so it's not only a rate of return, but are you also saying in your syndications that the real estate investor also has ownership and equity uh, in, um, in that syndication as well as to where when the property is turned around, improved and sold, they get a quote unquote, as they say, a piece of the action. Yes, absolutely. So you're part owner of the properties as the investor. You get to receive the, consist the cash flow that's coming from the operations of the property, um, which is typically paid out, you know, on a monthly or quarterly basis. And that's all dependent on the different sponsors that you're working with. And then also the appreciation aspect of it. So if you're able to go and add value to the property, improve the operating in the operations uh, down below, um, increase the net operating income. You know, you can have the same types of property on the same street. However, one property may be performing much better and more efficiently than the other property. And so that property that's performing efficiently is going to be worth a lot more money than the one down the street that's probably not getting as much um, income from their tenants. And, uh, you know, they have a lot of maintenance issues and everything like that with it. Um, so, the, that's within commercial real estate, you're able to add value. And that's what we love about it because we're able to do something which we call forced appreciation. You go in, improve the property and get that forced appreciation um, at the, especially at the end when you go to turn it around um, because you've now improved the operations, improved the bottom line, therefore improving and increasing the overall value of that property. So typically speaking, on average, when you invest in a project or a property and you have real estate investors come together and, and pull their funds or it's a group of investors, what is your typical exit strategy? Where are you looking to go with your typical project or property? So we like to look at a, around a five-year typical hold time period for these projects. Um, so when we look at it, we look at it from a base of how much value can we add to this property? How much value can we create um, by operating it and stabilizing this property over X number of years? And at the same time, thinking about the exit strategy and leaving some of the meat on the bones so that the next investor can come in and still be able to add value and then improve it and then bring it up to an even higher level on their end as well. So it's like a win-win situation all around. And all in the meantime, you're improving the uh, overall property, you're improving their overall um, 
uh, neighborhood as well. So it's just a win-win situation for, you know, not only the operators, but the investors, the community themselves and the residents. And what are some of the ways you improve the value or the valuation of the property? So some of the ways is, so we can take a look at, you know, some of the properties that we look at, they are the older builds. So maybe the finishes, the kitchen, they're not as up to standard or up to the newer, newer, uh, uh, more modern. They're not as modern as some of the different areas around them. And so we take a look at that. And and typically, you know, a rent a resident who's looking to rent a property is going to pay a little bit more for that nicer, newer kitchen than they are going to be a dated one. And so at that point, you know, you're able to rent it out for the newer leases to the newer tenants to coming out at more of a market rent, a market um more market values for it. And then some of the older tenants um, who are in there, you know, they're been there for quite some time. Um, you're able to offer them a newer, better unit, um, but it's going to come at a little bit higher cost. But some most people would typically trade that value because they see the higher end finishes, um, you know, to the kitchens, to the flooring, uh, to the walls. And sometimes also you're able to bring in some additional value by, um, you know, adding a dog park or a playground, you're improving the property and making it a place where residents want to live in it. And so they're wanting to pay a little bit more of a premium as well to get those different types of amenities for a better place to live. Do you typically on a project, do you typically go in and make improvements, say to the kitchen, you know, to the property itself before you raise rents? Are there some opportunities to where, a property is just not charging enough rents and you recognize that and you're just able to raise rents. Yep. That's, that's the opportunity cost as well, because sometimes there is where, you know, you have a mom and pop owner who hasn't really taken a look at the market value and what rents are really uh, renting out for. And so, you know, over time you're able to slowly increase the rents to the, the properties, even though you might not need to add any additional value to the property or the unit itself. But because of the market rents and what the market is renting it at, you're able to go ahead and increase that value over time as well. That certainly makes sense. So you mentioned a five-year period that um, in a lot of cases, you're looking to you're looking to be in the project for about five years to get the value up, to get the valuation up, perhaps there's improvements and et cetera. So if a private investor is interested in investing in one of your syndications, um, do they have a way to get out during that five-year period in case they have some type of emergency come up and they say, you know what, I've had something change in my life and I really need to get my investment out? So it's all written up in front. So there's something that we call like a placement, uh, a private placement memorandum as well. So it outlines all the risks and the risks and everything that, that's involved in investing in something like this. But typically within the syndication, you know, the the investment that you put in is illiquid. So what we what we suggest is that if you are down to you know your last dollar or your last couple um, tens of thousand dollars or something like that that you need for a rainy day. To not, to not use that for the investments, it should be something because with investments, you know, the, the biggest risk of the biggest risk of all is that all the money is lost. Right. However, when you're investing in real estate, there's some more um, there's more you're you're investing in a tangible asset. Um, and so. The fact that it's a little bit more of an illiquid uh, investment, it's not meant for everybody. So it really depends on like your certain, your particular situation and what you're going to need that, uh, that dollar for or the, the funds for down the road for seeing something, um, unforeseen events that may be happening in your lifetime and um, within those five, five year period hold. And sometimes it doesn't make sense for you to invest in a syndication at all. And so it really depends on your certain, your particular situation. And if you have um, the capacity or the room to actually invest in something like this, because like I mentioned, it's not for everybody. Right. Well, speaking of that, and I'm, I'm sure it will also depend on your projects, but um, on average, you know, what's the minimum amount that typically a real estate investor is going to need to have liquid to invest in uh, one of your syndications? 
the average amount is typically about $50,000. Um, some other sponsors as well, you know, there could be up to $100,000 minimum, but it really just depends on the project specific. But typically on average, you can expect about a $50,000 minimum to invest. Sure, that makes sense. Um, so what we've been, our topic so far has really been speaking to a potential private, private investor that may want to get involved with one of your syndications to receive above average returns and and get part of that action when you turn it around. So at this point in the show, let's get you to go ahead and share how people can get in contact with you to get more information about that. And then we're going to switch subjects and we're going to talk to real estate investors that are looking to raise capital for their own projects because you got a lot of experience in raising capital. So we want to speak to that audience as well. But first of all, how would people get in contact with you to find out more information about being a possible um, group investor in one of your syndications? So first of all, I would recommend that, you know, you get educated in the space. And so what we've done, myself and my partner, uh, we put together a resource where you can download it, visit our website. It's www.bonavestcapital.com forward slash checklist. And then there you'll get to see, you know, what's on, what are the types of questions that you should be asking when you're looking to invest in a syndication? Um, what kind of questions you should be looking for uh, to get answered by the sponsor and some of the things about the market itself. Um, and so for us, it's all about education, um, just providing information to the investors who's looking to get into this space. Because for us, um, our mantra, our motto is always, you know, um, work actively, but invest passively. I love it. And that website again, uh, again, uh, and that's great. I love it that uh, you've put together this checklist for particularly new real estate investors that, that are new to syndication. Go to www.bonavestcapital. That's B as in boy, O-N-A, B as in Victor, E-S-T, bonavestcapital.com forward slash checklist. That's awesome. Uh, Eileen, thank you so much for offering that checklist um, as, you know, a way to get started, to get educated. I mean, that's that's the same way I've done on raising millions and millions of dollars in private money is, first of all, educating new potential private investors or lenders uh, in getting involved in this space. So let's switch gears a little bit, Eileen, and let's speak directly to real estate entrepreneurs such as ourself, like you, Eileen, like me, that want to raise money either for syndication and multifamily or like myself, raising money, raising private capital, even for single family houses. Because you see, here's the deal. It's all the same money. It's the same money. It's just a matter of what the money is being used for. Like in my business, <clears throat> we've got 44 private lenders or so that loan their money on our single family house projects. But again, it's the same money used for different reasons in structured different ways. So Eileen, let me ask you a few questions on your experience on actually raising money. One of the first steps you do, you just shared, you educate people. In fact, 44, all 44 of our private lenders never heard of private investing. They never heard of private lending. They never heard of self-directed IRAs and how they could use their retirement funds, you know, to become involved as private lenders or syndicators or whatever. But I'm interested in asking you, where and how do you find your private investors? So I would say the biggest help for us to be able to connect with the investors well first before even having a conversation with them is by starting a podcast. Same thing like what you're doing right now is just through the education aspect of it and just sharing the knowledge and sharing them, sharing with uh, potential investors, like what's possible out there. What are some of the pitfalls? What are some of the things that you're learning? Um, some of the things that they should be aware of, um, you know, and it's just about educating and establishing a connection with them. And so for us, it's through the podcast, uh, you know, you're able to speak directly to different, uh, different guests on the show. You're able to share and become a thought leader in the space. And then now you've been able to, you know, connect with the, a potential listener or potential investor for 30, 40 minutes at a time. You're, you're in their ear. You're, 
you know, whether it be like a weekly podcast or a, a daily podcast, you know, that time they are willing and are spending their precious time to listen to you and establish that connection. So before you even have a conversation with a potential investor, you've already established a connection with them where they feel as if they know you, they know your background, they know your values, they know where you're coming from. And so the conversation becomes much more smoother um, as you're talking to them and getting to know them a little bit more because they feel like they have a connection with you already. You've already established a relationship with them. Um, and so for, for us, that's, that's the, the biggest way that has helped us is by creating that thought leadership platform through a podcast. Excellent. Prior to syndication and raising private capital, did you do any real estate investing projects? Yes, we actually started in the single family space and we did like some turnkey projects. So with that being the case, what did your life and business look like prior to raising private capital? Well, prior to raising capital, it was we were getting loans and we were investing all with our own personal capital. And so after we discovered that you're able to partner with other people and use OPM, which is other people's money, to be able to provide opportunities to other investors and people in the space who might not have the connections that we've been able to establish in this space and provide great opportunities that you're able to you know, gain cash flow, um, achieve appreciation or participate in the appreciation of the property as well. And also the tax benefits that come with investing in real estate. You're able to do so much more buy bigger properties, um, provide more opportunities for other people as well by raising other by raising capital, by by working with other potential investors and giving them the opportunities that they might not otherwise have. So Eileen, I got to ask you, how did you feel when you finally realized and saw and experienced a breakthrough that what you were really missing in your business to do bigger projects was private money and private investors. How'd that make you feel when you did your first deal like that? It was incredible because it takes a real mindset shift because if you're doing it on your own, you're going to run out of money, out of your own money. We only have a limited number of capital that we're able to to utilize to fund our own um, to fund our own projects. However, if you're able to partner with other people, it's incredible because now the opportunities are limitless. You're able to do bigger things that you might not have otherwise um, thought or dreamed of being possible. And so, for us. That was a huge mindset shift to be able to partner with other people, um, provide opportunities. And uh, yeah, that's that's the biggest thing is thinking about things differently and being able to provide these different types of opportunities for people who don't have the same access. What's your favorite reason for doing business with private investors? I think that my most favorite reason is creating those opportunities because for us that's kind of how we started also was we partnered with other people who are raising capital the same thing that we're doing now raising capital is because we saw as an opportunity to invest in something that we didn't have much knowledge about the that the fact that we could we could um, invest it and still have our money working for us instead of us having to work for our money and so for us being able to see those returns see those impact to the other investors and how that's helping them along and, and employing their, you know, unemployed dollars and having them work for them and seeing that money being hard at work that I think that's the most rewarding that works, uh, the ro most rewarding part of um, working with other investors. Yeah. Uh, you said it, Eileen, uh, my favorite reason for working with private lenders, private investors is that, it ends up being a win-win-win scenario for so many people. In fact, I think I shared with you on your podcast, my wife, Carol Joy, and I, over the years, we've received thank you written notes and letters from our private investors, our private lenders, thanking us for changing their retirement years, that they really couldn't get this you know, reliable rate of return, obviously not in the local bank, for sure. So it really is, I agree with you, it's just so rewarding that we're able to bring in so many more people into our business. Everybody benefits. It's win, win, win for everybody. And again, I thank you so much for offering that checklist to new real estate, or excuse me, new private investors. 
in real estate at the bonavestcapital.com forward slash checklist. But just if you would, before we close out, if you would highlight two or three items that a new uh, private investor or private lender needs to be on the watch out for before they invest in a syndication. The biggest one that I would say is do your due diligence, not on the deal itself, but on the sponsor, because when you're looking to invest in a private placement or a private investment, such as a syndication or um, private lending or whatever like that, you're really placing your bet on who's going to be operating and who is going to be utilizing your hard earned dollars. And so that's the most important part of it is to really do your due diligence and your your checks on the people that you're investing with because your values need to align. You know, you need to know, like, and trust them um, because it is a partnership. You're going to be, like I mentioned earlier, it's an illiquid investment. So you're not going to be able to just turn it around and say, I don't like this person. I'm going to pull it out, you know, after a couple of months of working with them or a year or something like that. And so it's easy to just hand your money over, but it's very difficult to pull it out. So really do your due diligence on the people that you're investing with and do your background checks and really establish a strong connection with them and really understand where their values are and do they align with with your goals and are they going to help you get to your goals, um, your financial goals or whatever you're looking to achieve? Are they, is that going to align? And then the second thing is to, you know, invest in something um, and just build up your knowledge. Knowledge is powerful. Knowledge is where it's going to, you know, make or break your investments. And so really understanding what you're getting into. And it all goes back to the sponsor. Um, you know, as long as they're willing to answer the questions that you have, um, willing to work with you, educate you, that's that's the biggest part. Awesome. Fantastic advice, Eileen. Eileen, thank you so much for taking the time to join me here on the show. Thank you so much for having me, Jay. This is really fun. <laughs> Absolutely. And again, uh, Eileen's website where she has got a free resource for you, particularly if you're a new private investor and you're looking to get high rates of return or above average rates of return anyway, uh, go to www.bonavestcapital, B as in boy, O-N-A, Bonavest, B-O-N-A-V-E-S-T, capital.com forward slash checklist Download that checklist and start your education on how to get above average rates of return very safely. Eileen, it's been great having you on. God bless you and thank you again. Thank you so much, Jay. You're welcome. Well, there you have it, my friend. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority, wishing you all the best. I need your help. Yes, your help. I really appreciate the likes, the shares, the subscribes. And here's where I need your help the most. If you can think of someone that you really believe would benefit from tuning into this show, be sure and share this show with your friend or family member. If you happen to be watching on um, YouTube, be sure and ring that bell. Thank you, Grandmaster UV, for the feedback there. Thank you for the awesome show feedback. And uh, if you're on YouTube, as I said, ring that bell so you are be sure to be notified of our upcoming events. We are now on Rumble. Yes, we are. So if you happen to be viewing us on Rumble, be sure and follow us there as well. Look forward to seeing you right here on the next show. Take care. God bless. I'm Jay Connor, wishing you all the best. Here's to taking your business to the next level right now. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jayconner.com slash money guide. That's jconner.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconnor.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Connor. Money.